Hello all and welcome to my presentation. My partner Gabriel couldn't make it today, but he does deserve fair credit for the data analysis portion of this project. First of all, I'd just like to say thank you to the many professors and experts who helped me. It definitely was a collaborative process and I'm so thankful for their guidance. Now, just a disclaimer, I started this project because I thought it would be easy for a computer to tell whether the location of one object influenced the location of another object. Um, but I was very wrong. And you're about to see the results of that original thought. Also, I deeply apologize if I mispronounce anything, and I'm sure my accent is probably going to come through very strong. Okay, so let's start with an overview of spatial stats in archaeology. So we've always been describing visually observable patterns in site reports, but since the 1960s and processualism, statistical methods started being applied to objectively quantify observed patterns. Statistics were critiqued during the interpretive turn with post-processualism and postmodernism, and that was probably right because you have to know when, how, and why to use each statistic, otherwise they can give false results. Um, spatial statistics also diminished a little bit when GIS was introduced because those softwares implemented pre-existing basic first-order stats like density estimation, which I'm sure many people are familiar with. Nowadays, there seems to be a slight resurgence of spatial stats because ArcGIS and QGIS and similar programs have limitations, um, like not including second-order statistical tests, which I'll get into. Also note that Karen's 2015 PhD discusses everything I'm talking about today in much more detail. So I apologize for this scary looking table. However, I'm not sure how much background knowledge everyone has regarding this very specific niche field. So I tried to summarize um, the topic here and I'm not going to go through all of it, but feel free to email me and I'll give you the slides. The main difference to know is that if you want to test whether the location of some things influence the locations of other things, um, you're always dealing with second order effects. Now, there are several options for tests you can conduct to test second, second order effects on point patterns. Um, however, as of this year, none are implemented in ArcGIS. So you can only choose between R, which requires you to know how to program, um, or TFQA which is a program developed by Keith Kinter in the 1980s. And I would have used that, except um, it's extremely outdated and it won't run on any modern operating systems. And it also costs 50 US dollars. So yeah. Um, now, first order stats are still good as well. And they tell you whether points are clustered or dispersed in the landscape, but they don't tell you why. And that's up to your personal interpretation. Now, I find first order stats to be personally less interesting because in archaeology we're almost always dealing with definite clusters in the landscape and so trying to prove it's clustered is not that valuable. Um, however, as you will see, I did end up turning to first order effects like topography during my interpretation phase to explain why I got the results I did. Now, just a brief note before we go on about proving statistical significance. Um, a lot of New papers use a method called CSR or complete spatial randomness to prove that they have achieved a significant result. Um, and this is probably because CSR is built into ArcGIS. Now, <laughs> CSR involves getting your original point pattern and then randomly generating the same number of points across the study area, as you can see in my diagram. Then you can say that your point pattern is more clustered when compared to complete spatial randomness, right? Now, this method is good for regular statistics, but it's terrible for archaeology because human behavior is rarely ever random. Now, CSR presumes that all locations in the study area have an equal likelihood of an event occurring, um, but this is not true. There could be rivers in the way, difficult terrain, etc. So it is a bit of a cheat way of saying your result is significant statistically. So what you should actually do is called random labeling or RL, where you take your observed point pattern and you randomly shuffle the labels and you repeat this 1,000 times. Then, or actually however many permutations you decide, but usually it should be 1,000. Um, then if your original point pattern is more clustered than all of the shuffles, it will exhibit a statistically significant degree of clustering. Now, your imagination is really the limit in terms of your research question, and you can test any interaction between events which influence their locations. And it definitely could be useful for a final excavation report. 
So I'll just quickly show some examples of second order effects. Um, this project by Karen showed that you can test questions like, is one artifact type clustered around another artifact type? And in this case, he actually found that there was no clustering, but that's still useful information. Now, Karen's other project tested whether family members were buried close to each other or if there was a simple chronological internment. And he did that by using specific hereditary skeletal traits. And he actually found a patrilineal internment model with kin groups represented in different colours in the picture. So that's pretty cool. Now, this is my case study. And it was heavily inspired by Scotland's Rock Art Project and Dr. Tersha Barnett and Joanna Valdez Tullett, who are also presenting at this conference. So I'm very excited to see their presentation and find out if our results support each other. Um, now, my study area encompassed freshwater Loch Tay, which is located in central Scotland. And it contains an extremely high concentration of prehistoric rock art, which you will have seen in the backgrounds to the slides so far. This abstract rock art is often called cup and ring marks because there is a central depression surrounded by concentric grooved rings. Now, SCRAP's or Scotland's Rock Art Project, also known as SCRAP, they define several case study areas. Um, I amalgamated several in my study area, which is roughly indicated by the red box. Usually before testing whether two point patterns are attracted or separated from each other, you would first have to establish that they are themselves either clustered or dispersed. However, we skipped this step since Scrap had already performed kernel density cluster analysis in ArcGIS, as you can see. Now, cup and ring marks have a very long chronology spanning the Neolithic period to the early Bronze Age. And because of that, a lot of researchers believe they may have a spatial association to other monuments in created during that time period. For example, on screen, you can see Scrap found a high percentage of rock art associated with burial cans. However, these guys measured association by field walking, um, visually inspecting maps, and also checking Canmore Heritage Database entries. So, for example, the entry might say, one hut with a cranog, a burial can, and a cup marked stone. So this is kind of more of a circumstantial correlation, and it's not proven statistically. So that's what I decided to do with my project. And I also couldn't bite off more than I could chew, so I just thought that that would be an achievable question to answer, which it obviously kind of blew out into something else entirely. So anyway, here's some more work by Gordon Barclay showing there is definitely something going on with Neolithic monument types in the study area. Okay. So first I mapped the different monument types in GIS, and I could already tell there was definitely a concentration of rock art in the study area. Now here's a zoomed in view showing the study site with cup and ring marks in red as compared to cans in orange and barrows in green. I exported the data as a CSV and imported it into R for analysis. Now just take a look at the points and note how they appear to be distributed. Now before running tests in R, I had to assess whether my point patterns adhered to this thing called spatial homogeneity and correlation stationarity, which is a complicated way of asking, does the density of the points stay the same across the study area? Um, in archaeology, most point patterns will not exhibit correlation stationarity, meaning you can only employ certain specific tests. Now, I have painstakingly compiled a list of the relevant tests on screen, and the ones I chose based on Karen's PhD uh, are bolded. But which test you use is entirely dependent on the study area, your research question, and a whole bunch of other factors. So let's run through the results of the first test called an A-index, which was developed by Ian Hodder in 1978. So what we have here is the computed A value for my observed point pattern compared to a histogram of randomized points. Basically, the A value lies if the A value lies within the curve, it isn't significant. And if it lies outside the curve, it is significant. Our value lay outside the curve, so it was significant. And, and since the value was less than 1, 0 0.436, the patterns were separated. So within the study area, cup and ring marks and cans are spatially segregated from one another. Testing cup and ring marks against barrows, we got an A index value of 0 0.5. Um, and that lies smack bang 
in the middle of the randomization, giving us an insignificant result. So from this, we couldn't reject the null hypothesis. Now, because we got some inconclusive results, we decided to perform another test called a local cross pair correlation function. I've annotated the example on screen showing you how to interpret these. Basically, whether the line is above or below this complete spatial randomness threshold will tell you whether the pattern is clustered or dispersed and at what scales. Okay, so the cross PCF result for cup and rings as compared to cans produced a statistically significant result. At under one kilometers, cup and ring marks proved to be clustered, but above one kilometer, cup and ring marks and cans were separated. So that's very interesting. Now the same test performed for cup and ring marks versus barrows also gave a significant result that proved that at distances of under 2.5 kilometers, cup and ring marks and barrows were clustered, but over 2.5 kilometers, cup and ring marks and barrows were separated. Now, after communicating with Adrian Baddeley, who's the world expert on spatial statistics, we concluded that the summary functions I used are technically too simple to support any definitive conclusions about the data. So for this, you would have to use something like a multivariate regression model. However, I was only copying what all the other archaeologists had been doing. So either everyone is cheating and oversimplifying a little bit to get their publishable results, or us archaeologists are not very good at understanding statistics. And it's probably, there's probably truth to both theories. So summarizing and interpreting now, it is very important to note that the A index reflects the interaction of both point patterns as a whole. So they indicate cup and rings and cans are segregated and that cup and rings and barrows might be segregated. Now, the local cross PCF is used to identify sub-patterns within the study area. So it did identify some clustering at less than a kilometre, which could be further investigated by a surface survey, but overall the patterns were also segregated. Essentially, it is clear that there is a second order effect of separation between monuments and rock art within the study area. Why that distribution exists may be related to the first order density effects on the respective site types. Also, first order and second order effects can co-occur, which each provide complementary information for a more comprehensive understanding. So why are they separated? Well, I have several theories based on a lot of the pre-existing literature. Now, first, the repulsion in monument types may be because of topography and terrain. So within the study area, cup and ring marks are mainly located immediately surrounding Loch Tay, which is enclosed by steep Munro Mountains. Compared to cup and ring marks, cairns are located further along the strath, northeast, on land characterised by gentle valleys and more arable pasture. So practical considerations, including the availability of materials like stone and turf, and the difficulty of transporting these materials up steep slopes, may also play a role. Secondly, on screen, you can see that the separation between cup and ring marks and barrows or cans could relate to prehistoric mobility and routeways. So you can see several proposed routes across Scotland that actually made use of locks and rivers. And these routes could have connected concentrations of rock carvings at Loch Tay with those at Kilmarn. Now, doctors Barnett and Valdez Tullet have previously found that terrestrial accessibility of rock art was varied. It was sometimes located near paths and sometimes far away. This indicates that slope aspect was probably more important than location near walking routes for prehistoric rock art selection. And we can't say how important location near aquatic routes was because um, they didn't do that test. Now, this is in opposition to the placement of funerary monuments, including cairns and barrows, which are often placed near routes, terrestrial routes. So my results kind of further back up Scrap's findings. Third, the most compelling theory for monument and rock art segregation is the varying chronologies and beliefs respectively involved in their construction. So the mid to late Neolithic groovedware period saw significant changes in ceremonial and burial architecture. Earlier, predominantly linear, communal mortuary structures were phased out and individual circular monuments and burials became more popular. There is a trend from less hierarchical to more hierarchical and more prestige within the landscape. Now, this tendency towards circularity 
defined space, boundary and enclosure in both domestic and ritual architecture corresponds to the most intense period of rock art creation. Finally, the steep slopes where cut marks are often found are conducive to transitional transhuman landscapes and well suited to cosmological belief systems. Whereas the places where cans and barrows are found are not really suited to such beliefs and were probably important for different reasons, more mortuary focused. At Ben Lawyers, most rock art is aligned to the solar arcs, which has led to theories that they may symbolize the horizon or a layered or inverted model of the world, or demarcate the split between water, earth, and sky worlds. In comparison, barrows and cans are more linked to group prestige, communal gatherings, and ancestor worship. As people's subsistence styles changed in the mid to late Neolithic, perhaps the meaning of cup and ring marks also evolved as they increasingly resembled round structures in the ceremonial landscape. From my research, it was clear that prehistoric peoples had a very complex process for selecting their monument sites. Often new monuments were built over existing ones, previous monuments were reworked, or a landscape site was chosen based on perceived spiritual significance. Monument placement was highly influenced by the surrounding landscape and whether it was necessary to evoke relations to the cosmos. The results presented here provide more evidence for and are consistent with theories that rock art was primarily designed to address solar axes, axes. <laughs> while barrows and cairns had a very different function. The results further suggest prehistoric rock art is spatially separated from other monuments. And association with pre-existing monuments was likely not a primary consideration in site selection. This does not invalidate data collected by other researchers, especially data external to the study area, as after prehistoric people had fulfilled a primary site selection criterion, for example, appropriate aspect and solar alignments, it's very plausible they then chose to reference other sacred locations in the vicinity. So what can we take away from the examples presented today? Well, first, we desperately need second order effect stats tools that a person who is handy with GIS can use, not needing a degree in data science. <laughs> um, for testing spatial statistical significance, make sure you are not cheating. So choose the correct method of establishing significance for your project and use multiple stats if necessary or if you're getting dubious results. Furthermore, um, the field as a whole is actually still quite underdeveloped and there are new um, statistical tests being discovered every year. So I would love to see some more investment um, and interest in how those could be applied to archaeological situations. Finally, statistics are not a replacement for our observational capabilities. It is equally important to carefully consider the context in your analysis and determine what effect non-spatial arguments have on your area being studied. Thank you and feel free to pop questions in the chat or email me at my email.